Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 292, featuring the second installment of my interview with Mr. John Cutter. This part of the interview, we talk about his days at Cinemaware, that preeminent game developer, especially known for their Amiga titles, including, of course, Defender of the Crown, Sinbad and the Throne of the Falcon, uh, Rocket Ranger, uh, King of Chicago, and many more of my personal favorite games. Anyway, we've got a lot of great stuff in this segment, so without further ado, here is Mr. John Cutter. Well, here's a question. I think I know the answer to this, but one of my viewers named Thamer wrote in. I told him I was interviewing you. He wants to know, uh, what is your what was your favorite computer back in these days? Uh, well, obviously, it had to have been the Amiga. Uh, that was, you know, that was, if, I think if the Amiga had taken off, uh, I think CinemaWare would have, would have survived, you know, obviously a lot longer than it, than it did, because we really got that machine. Um, I mean, it just it gave us it gave us so many tools to work with in terms of the sprites and you know the audio and uh, for the time it was revolutionary. What was it like working on Defender of the Crown? I mean, you've talked about it a little bit already, but you know, I just think of how seminal that title was uh, for the Amiga. You know, I'm, I'm guessing there must have been quite a bit of excitement around development for it. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty amazing and and i think actually most of the ces shows that we would go to for the next two or three three years after that uh people would come and see us uh from all the other game companies um it was a special stop to kind of come into our booth or to come into our meeting room and kind of see what we were doing now i mean we were we were the the company that everybody kind of wanted to be uh, and it really you know i i the gameplay in some of those early titles were was was not great. Uh, it was a lot of it was just the presentation and the art. I think that made them uh, as, as successful as they were. And Defender in particular, it was just kind of magical how it all kind of it came together. Um, the the programming when I joined the, the the team, the art was amazing. Jim's you know art that he was working on was fantastic. We had some great music. Uh, that was also being done. The design from Kellen Beck was coming along and, and was looking really fantastic. But the code was was kind of in trouble. And at the last minute, Bob and I kind of said, we've, we've been promising that this game is going to be done on this date. It's got to get done. It's not going to happen with this company that we're using. So Bob went out and found R.J. Michael, who was one of the guys that actually designed the Amiga. And R.J. said, yeah, I can finish the game for you in three months. And he did, but it was it was a struggle. Uh, I remember Kellen actually flew out to be with him to work with him a little more closely and you know give him uh, discs because of course the internet wasn't around. So whenever Jim would finish some artwork, he put it in a, uh, a FedEx envelope, drive it to the airport, and and I remember him telling me these horror stories that uh, he'd be up you know for like 20 hours working and would drop you know drive to the airport to drop this thing off to try to get it in Fe you know, to FedEx in time. And on the way there, all of a sudden, he wasn't seeing the road and trees. He was just seeing pixels. <laughs> I, it's a true story. And is he? I think he almost had a nervous breakdown working on that. Oh, he worked on it so hard. But anyway, so he would make, he, make a great documentary. Yeah, yeah. He would deliver this stuff to Kellen. Uh, Kellen would drive it over to RJ's place, and RJ was so concerned about being distracted, he would stand on the other side of the door and just say, "Feed it, feed it through the door." And so Kellen would feed it through the door and they would chat at the door there for, you know, for a few minutes. And then he would say, OK, I'm done. And then he'd go back and and would keep working. Yeah, but he, he got it done. He finished it all. Definitely fits the profile of the eccentric genius, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah, RJ, RJ is another guy who's obviously uh, really, really brilliant. So lots of masterminds around this this product. I remember talking, when I talked to Bob, uh, Jacob, I had him. I, I don't. It's been a while. I don't. Remember. It must have been about 2011, I guess. Uh, but he said when you were making this game, you wanted it to, wanted it to be somewhat like the board game Risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was uh, Bob and Kellen. I think were kind of the principal guys behind that. Um, 
Kellen actually, is, his original uh, design, original plan was to make um, what would perhaps have been the very first real-time strategy game. Uh, through most of the development with RJ, everything was happening in real time. And I think we were coming down to like the final month and we were having all kinds of strange issues like uh, a dialogue box would pop up on the screen and you'd be getting ready to click something and then something would happen in real time in the game and the dialogue box would go away and I just thought we are never going to fix all of these issues. So I stepped in as the producer and made the call, we cannot do a real time game. It's just too complicated. We've got to turn it into a turn-based game, uh, which is maybe a little closer to their original vision of you know kind of a risk style, uh, mm -hmm. risk style uh, kind of adventure. Um, but yeah, I made that call, and I, I always felt a little bad about it. I'm trying to imagine how it would have worked as a real-time game. I mean, that's, that'd be quite a different experience, I'm sure. Oh yeah, definitely was. Um, I again, I think. As you were making your taking your turns and making your moves, uh, the enemies were also moving into territory, and they weren't waiting for you to finish. They would. There, I think there was probably timers, and after a, a period of time, they would they would take over an adjacent territory, for example. Um, and it didn't matter, you know, what you were doing at the time. It could happen whenever they were kind of ready to do it. But yeah, again, it just it complicated things a lot. I've got a copy of it. I don't know if you can see it back here. <laughs> I remember one of the things that uh, Bob talked about was how he, he had a thing for chesty women, I think was, it was, oh, how, yeah. he, was how he put that. Uh, did you have any feedback on the, the box? Uh, no comment. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, really I, slick, though, with the, the popcorn oh, yeah. inside there. I mean, this was... I mean, you. I, mean, I just remember the excitement with this game because we'd just gotten our Amiga 1000, brand new computer. Uh, rushed out everybody's talking about this game you get it you open it up the box it's just so cool you know you can't wait to play this and then it blows you you know you actually it actually manages to live up to all the hype which is uh you know incredibly rare yeah there's a little picture of uh it's like kellen there yeah uh do you have your picture in here somewhere that i might have missed <laughs> I don't remember if it's in there or not yeah that was exciting it it's uh it's a little hard, I think, in the climate today, uh, as I was kind of thinking about some of our early Sinwar games, and, and we definitely had a Knights in Shining Armor, you know, Rescue the Damsel in Distress, uh, kind, of a, uh, kind of a plan for all of those games. That was sort of our uh, modus operandi. Um, but now it just sort of feels like digital misogyny, so I, <laughs> kind of hard to, hard to think about some of those games. Yeah. I was uh, wondering if you had a favorite damsel. Favorite damsel. I guess I'm still kind of partial to the uh, the. I don't remember any names. The blonde, the blonde woman in in uh, in Defender mm -hmm. was uh, I think was always one of my favorites. I want to say there's a blonde brunette redhead and a. Are there's there three or four? I think it's about three. I I don't recall. Were those based on real women, or were those just Jim's uh, creations? I think they were just his creations. I don't think he actually based them on anybody, but I'm not positive about that. Hmm. We Did you play SDI? I, I have played that one. I'm not nearly as familiar with it as I am the other ones, though, I have to admit. Yeah, not probably not one of our better games, but uh, talking about Damsels, I, I remember that um, there, was a, there was a sequence in that game where you would have to invade a Russian... Uh, space station um, that was that had been attacking. So of course, back in the uh, late '80s, I guess when all this was happening, um, and there was a scene with uh, with a with a female Russian uh, cosmonaut where they would, as they did in Defender of the Crown, they would kind of come together and embrace. Um, and then after that, he would hop into the main character would hop into his into his spaceship and take off. And as a joke, the artists after that scene happened had put in like this big red lipstick mark on his cheek and, and ruffled up his, his collar and, and put a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. Uh, and they forgot that it was in there. They put it in there to surprise me, and I, I hadn't been testing the game for a while, and we almost launched with it. <laughs> that would have been pretty cool to leave it in. That was a little terrifying. At the time, it would have been, it doesn't sound that bad now, I think, with the way games have sort of evolved, but at the time, it was a little, I think that would have been a little bit too much. It was 
sort of curious about that. I was reading about Sinbad. I'm not kind of skipping around here a little bit, but some uh, of the stuff about Sinbad and the Throne of the Falcon. I was reading a review of that, and I guess, I don't know if it was uh, you guys doing it, but it seemed like there was an effort to kind of say, look, this is an adult game, not necessarily pornographic, but just, you know, intended for, it's not for kids, right? I mean, was that sort of a vibe that was going on at uh, CinemaWare? It's a quit thinking of games as just being for kids and let's cater to a, an older audience. Yeah, I think we definitely were, were trying to appeal to uh, to an older, more sophisticated crowd with our games. Uh, and again, that a lot of that was Bob's uh, inspiration, Bob and Phyllis, who, who co-founded the company together. Um, Bob was always into movies and he really wanted to kind of bring that cinematic feel um, to games. In fact, I remember one of the things that really inspired him before he even got into the computer games business was uh, he was he was working at a uh, on a computer uh, terminal at the library, and there was a kid uh, I think next to him playing wizardry, and he had lost. I guess he had gone down into the dungeon and had been fighting for a while and got killed. And I, if I remember right, uh, you could lose characters permanently in that game, and he lost this character. And started crying. Wow! Right there in the library, with just tears are running down his cheeks, and and Bob thought, "Wow, if games can affect people emotionally like that, that's a business that I want to be a part of." And again, he wanted it to he wanted to tell cinematic stories. It's amazing how often in these interviews, wizardry comes up. I mean, that title. I don't know what what the landscape would look like without without it. Yeah. So what about this Three Stooges game? You know, I remember that. I remember. I remember it was very difficult. That's mainly what I remember about that game. At least for me. I don't know if somebody else might have breezed through it, but uh, I guess I read somewhere that the idea for that was uh, that you wanted to make it like a board game. Yeah, that was really the inspiration. Uh, I my friends and I used to play Life. Um, I grew up in Wyoming, and and summers in Wyoming could get kind of hot sometimes, and. We had a very cool basement, and, and we would go down there on hot summer days. Mom would bring us popsicles and another one of my kind of favorite childhood memories. And one of the games that we liked to play was, was Life. Uh, and I, as I was trying to think about ways to incorporate all these different uh, components of, you know, and, and things that sort of made this Three Stooges of Three Stooges, you know, the punching and slapping and, and uh, some of the crazy adventures they had, I thought maybe maybe the board game life would would kind of suit that uh, as kind of a structure, and so that's that yeah that's kind of how Three Stooges came about. Were you a big fan of the Three Stooges? Uh, I was not a huge fan. Um, by the end of the project, though, I was I definitely was a fan, and that's happened with several games uh, over the course of my career, including Wings. When Bob told me he wanted me to design a World War One flight simulator, I just thought I. I don't know anything about World War One. I'm not really a history buff. I've never really played a flight simulator. I don't know anything about them. Uh, so yeah, it, but in working on these games, I always get extremely passionate about the subject matter. And Stooges and Wings were, were no exception. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, Wings, I was just playing the remake a while earlier today. I don't know if you, have you played that, the remastered a little, edition? A little bit, yeah. yeah. How do you feel about that? I think it's good. It's uh, it's always kind of hard to go back, uh, and and I, you're never quite sure. Do you want to cater to the crowd that remembers the original game uh, and loved it, or do you want to try to do something kind of new and 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 modern, kind of give it a fresh a fresh spin? And finding the right balance there, I think, is incredibly difficult. But I think they did a good job. I always loved uh, Wings. I think I played it two or three times on, on the Amiga. I like the way that I always enjoyed the character in that, and the sort of the way the all the Everything kind of, uh, I guess, the storyline, you know, I really got into the, it sort of had a unique feel to it. It really did feel like some, what I would imagine anyway, a World, World War I uh, pilot must have felt like. Now, yeah. I, I don't think, it, it's hard to almost to believe that you didn't know anything about this. Uh, but I guess I was reading you and Ken Goldstein. Uh, you got access to some kind of archive uh, with yeah. like old photos and stuff. Okay. Oh, that's yeah, true. Well, yeah. Actually, what, what really happened with Wings is that after, uh, you know, and, and some of the early Cinemore games were things that I, you know, I came up with the original concept for or my ideas. But in that case, Bob actually did walk in one day and said, hey, 
I've got this guy who does 3D games. I want to. I think we should do a, a World War One flight simulator, and I need you to design it. Uh. So I went. I went to the library because this was pre-internet, so we couldn't really do research. There was no way to do research on the internet. Uh, I drove to the library and you know, kind of slam on the car door. I wasn't very happy about it. And, and I found some books in the library about World War I pilots. Uh, you know, Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron, uh, Albert Ball, um, Eddie Rickenbacker, a bunch of those guys. And I started reading some of their stories. And within half an hour, I was completely hooked. I mean, these guys, he, the airplane had not been, had only been invented like 15, 20 years before World War I. And it was still this brand new crazy thing that, you know, people were crazy enough to get in and go up into the sky. And they're not only going up in the sky, they're actually shooting at each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just got totally, I mean, I was so into those stories that I was reading that when I drove home that night, I could picture the cars coming at me on the freeway as airplanes that were attacking. Uh, it was, it was, yes, it was phenomenal. Some of those, some of those stories. And I really wanted to capture that in the game. I wanted people to understand what it must have felt like to be a pilot back in World War One, which is why uh, why I wanted to do the the diary as a way to sort of do our narrative. Yeah, it worked worked perfectly. Oh, good. I, just, I still get goosebumps with that uh, that opening sort of cinematic with the right was it Orville Wright, I guess, the inventors of the airplane. It just looks so crude and everything, and barely lifts off the ground. And then <laughs> it's like a minute later, you see the you know the World War One. Airplanes. I mean, it must have. It's, it's it's one of those things I, you know, I struggle to try to imagine what it must have been like and how revolutionary it really was. Exactly. Uh, and as you as you mentioned earlier, Ken uh, Ken and I, when we were putting the manual together, and I really wanted to do a nice uh, manual, um, and I can't remember how it came about, but we we found out about these archives in San Diego, I think. Uh, it was some sort of a. a a, a museum uh air and we, space archives I yes believe. and we actually got uh the rights to go down there and and use some of their photographs and read through some of the books and it's it's a it, it was a private archive at least the section that we were in so that was that was a real treat that's pretty neat so they weren't bothered that yeah we're just we're making a game no uh, not at all <laughs> they probably thought it was cool <laughs> yeah and i and i think they could tell you know how excited uh, ken and i were about the subject matter think that probably helped well i just wanted to briefly mention uh, sinbad and the, and the throne of the falcon and i i had uh peter oliphant on oh, great. Uh, back in 2012 and i was just kind of wondering uh you know a little bit about that how did that how did things go with uh with peter at uh cinema cinema where uh things went well with peter um he was always a, a very creative uh funny guy um, I don't know if he played TV sports football, uh, but he, he and I came up with, and I think it was mostly Peter, uh, came up with a bunch of the, uh, the ads. My little funny ads like uh, in and out brake service, we won't slow you down, uh, that kind of thing. And, and Peter came up with a, with a lot of those. Uh, so he was, he was fun. He was, and we're still pretty good friends. He's, he's a great guy to work with. The original um, designer and programmer and the, uh, kind of a one uh, – triple threat guy was Bill Williams who did the original Sinbad uh, for the Amiga. Uh, he was Bill Williams guy. Yeah. He's not the Bill. Did he, is he the one that did mind Walker? Uh, might've been, I know he did a game called Alley cat. Hmm. Um, yeah, that might've been his game too. I'm not, not sure, but he was, he was a really, really nice guy. He lived in a geodesic dome in Minnesota or somewhere. And uh, wow. just a very gentle, you know, it was one of those guys that every time you would talk to him, you would come away in a better mood. Hmm. Well, one of my favorites, I mean, this I like a lot of the Cinemaware games, as you could probably tell by now, but uh, King of Chicago. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't see that, it doesn't seem like people talk about that game as much as, as I think they should. I mean, I really love this thing. Uh, I really like the whole gangster 30s, uh, you know, that's just kind of a favorite uh, era of mine uh, to look at. And it seems to me, thinking back on it, that it really seemed to pretty far ahead of its time. You know, now we, of course, you've got Grand Theft Auto and that, that sort of thing. But uh, I think there's even one of those Grand Theft Auto games that is set sort of in the 30s. 
film noir. I can't think of the name of it right off the top. Of my... <laughs> I can't believe I can't think of it. But uh... Only noir? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah that one kind of reminded me of, of King of Chicago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, King of Chicago was an interesting game. I think it was it was originally developed on the Macintosh. Um, on the Macintosh? Why was it? A, why? Why? <laughs> I, I I don't remember exactly. A guy named Doug Sharp uh, uh, came up with that game. Um, he programmed it, did all the writing for it. Um, he was a big Macintosh fan, and. Um, yeah, the black and white Macintosh is, is the first place that we actually uh, launched that game. We redid it later, uh, improved the graphics um, with uh, Rob Landeros, who went on to do Seventh Guest and, and a bunch of those games uh, with Graham Devine. Uh, he did, I think he did a lot of the art. He was our art director at the time. And so we redid, redid it all. Uh, but I think it lost a little bit when we, uh, when we ported it over. The original version uh, actually had these very... I think I think they were clay heads. I think uh, Doug was actually modeling all of the characters with clay and then actually digitizing them and animating them into the computer. Clay <laughs> on the computer. Yeah. <laughs> wow. They were very they were very crude looking characters. Uh, and I remember we hired a marketing guy at Cinemore, and I remember having a conversation with him, and I said, "King of Chicago is this awesome little gem of a game." Why aren't we spending more of our marketing dollars on that? Why are we spending all of our marketing money on Defender of the Crown, which everybody already knows about? We're getting tons of press coverage. We're getting, and I remember he just kind of shook his head and said, you just don't get marketing. Dude. And I kind of understand that now. At the time, it didn't make sense to me. But I, I think, again, the thinking was, if you can spend a million dollars on marketing to get something from 100,000 units to, to 300,000 units, it's better than getting something from... 15,000 units to, you know, to 45,000. I always wonder with that game if there had been plans to actually have voice voice actors uh, do all the dialogue. Because, I mean, it seems like that would be ideal. Yeah. I think it needed that. But there was too much dialogue, um, and the discs were, you know, we didn't have enough room uh, with all the graphics and everything to have a lot of voices in there. Uh, but, yeah, I think that definitely would have benefited the game. Yeah, that's a good one to a good candidate for a remake. I would I would think you could do a lot with the with that. Uh, so I remember talking to Bob about the TV sports games. We'd mentioned them a few times, but I, it seems like I remember him saying that those were by far and away the the best sellers for the company. Is that true? Or was it? You remember being uh, more? Of, sounds like you you think Defender of the Crown might have been the. I Defender I think was definitely our best seller. Uh, Bob. Bob, I could be misremembering too. I didn't look this yeah. up. I just seem to recall him saying that. Bob may, I mean, Bob had a much tighter grasp on all of the, the sales numbers, of course, Bob and Phyllis. Um, so that could be right, but I, I, I think Defender had to have been a bigger bigger seller. But they did well. The, the TV sports games, especially TV sports football, uh, did very well for us. Yeah, I would be shocked that they, I mean, those were really, really good sports games, and they definitely nailed, felt a lot more realistic. I mean, that's what the sports genre has always been about, right, is the realism. Yeah. Uh, so they, they really seem to, to hit home. Uh, what about Rocket Ranger? You know, I, I like that game, too. I, I never was able to master the fine art of the takeoff. Oh, so hard. <laughs> uh, so what's going on with that? There was no connection to that movie, The Rocketeer? You know, I don't remember. Definitely not the movie. There was... Uh... There was a graphic novel, I think, that the movie was based on. And I do believe that we were in talks with the, the, the developer, the writer of the, of the novel, uh, but we couldn't come to an agreement. And, and I think at that point we went off and decided to do, you know, to do Rocket Ranger. Um, they both were, Bob was a big fan of the old movie serials like Commander Cody and um, Hack of the Airmen or something. I can't remember the name of some of those. And I think those were the same serials that inspired the Rocketeer guy. So they kind of come from the same source material. But yeah, Rocket Ranger was Rocket Ranger was a lot of fun. I think that was one of our better after Defender and, and maybe the TV sports games. I think that was one of our better better titles. That was another Kellen Beck design. I had a few um, threw a few ideas of my own in there, but that was that was Kellen's design. 
I just I love this that idea of going back to that era and pulling out these sort of concepts we don't really see anymore. You know, a Rocket Man type character, but it's it's kind of a mix of nostalgia, but it's also new because nobody's ever made a game, you know, based around that before. So it's it's really fun. Yeah. Uh, so after CinemaWares, is that when you uh, did a stint at New World Computing? Yeah, actually, uh, going back to CinemaWare for a second, I think, mm-hmm. you know, one of one of the other things that we were trying to do with our CinemaWare games um, was we wanted all of the games to appeal to those kind of base childhood fantasies that we all have, or that we, we used to have. Uh, Knights in Shining Armor, um, you know, rescuing princesses, again, very misogynistic now, but... Um, I think with Rocket Ranger, one of the childhood fantasies that we were trying to, to, to capture there was, was flying. I mean, we all wanted to fly when we were younger. And the idea of being able to run along and then just kind of, you know, jump in the air and, and fly somewhere is, is, uh, is very, very powerful. Uh, I'll admit to being a kid and playing that game for a while and then putting on a, a backpack and running down the driveway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's fun, fun, fun memories. Yep. Sorry, what was your other question? Oh, I was, uh, so after CinemaWare, you went on to New World Computing, right? Yes. Uh, I'm wondering, I'm kind of wondering why, you know, why did you leave CinemaWare? What was in the, how did you get this job at New World Computing? Well, CinemaWare actually, uh, again, I was employee number one uh, at CinemaWare, and we had a, we had a real good run. Uh, we we uh, were a little slow transitioning to the PC, which, which hurt us. Um, and I think there was some kind of a deal. We were trying to get a PC version of TV sports football done, and it was late. And I think that hurt us. And I think Bob sold part of the company to NEC, which also turned out to, to not be a, a good move. And then Electronic Arts was going to buy us, and then that fell through at the last minute. Again, apparently, Trip Hawkins was pushing for it, but the board of directors said no, and Cinemore shut down. So that's that's actually when I left Cinemaware, and uh, I remember I interviewed at Electronic Arts, and they liked me, and they called me back for another interview, and and uh, we're getting ready to sign a, a an agreement, to sign a deal. I was going to go work for them as a producer, and something happened in that second interview. Somebody that I talked to, I rubbed them the wrong way or something, and they called me back and they said, you know, we've actually had a change of heart. Uh, we we're not going to hire you after all. And that, and I kind of panicked, and I called up uh, Bing Gordon or somebody, some big muckety muck at, at Electronic Arts, and I said, "Look, I'm going places, and if you guys want to go with me, you can go with me." But I, you know, and I and I gave them a big hard sell, and they said, "You know what? We're right. We're sorry. We should never have withdrawn that offer. We're gonna we're gonna take you up on that. Why don't you come back out, and we'll we'll sign the agreement." Well, in the meantime, I had interviewed at New World Computing, and they were looking for a director of product development. So they made me an offer, and they were just down the road. It didn't, you know, I wouldn't have to move my family to to uh, Northern California. So I had to call Electronic Arts back after I'd made this big, passionate speech and tell them, eh, "Okay, sorry, never mind. I took another job." So that was a little bit unfortunate, but yeah, New World was fun. I got to meet John Van Kanigam and uh, Elliot uh, Spitzer, Ron Ron Spitzer, who was uh, kind of the business guy there. Um, but it was a pure product development role, and I and I realized after I was there for a short time that what I really really like um, I like uh, I like the creative side more. I don't like just managing projects. Um, so I'd been there for maybe six months, seven months, uh, and I was at a trade show, and and uh, Jeff Tanell at Dynamics came up to me and he said, hey. I, I remember you from from Cinemaware. I would love for you to come out and be a be a creative guy for us. And I said, "Oh, like a designer producer?" He said, "No, just a creative guy. Your responsibility would be to make the game fun. That is your whole job." And I said, "How much do I have to pay you for this job?" And he said, <laughs> "This just came out of the blue. This all it did. It did." Uh, and I thought that is that is what I want to be doing. So I he hired me, and I went to. Uh, uh, went over there to, to Dynamics and then immediately poached Neil Halford, who was uh, one of the best writers that I've ever that I've ever met. Uh, I met him while I was at New World. I think he did. You must have worked with him on Planet's Edge. Yes. Yeah, Planet's Edge was. I think, I think Neil. I can't remember if Neil was the designer. I know he was the writer on that game, um, and then a couple other titles there. 
And yeah, that's that's where I met Neil. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a third installment, probably looking at two more installments with Mr. Cutter. And we've got a lot, uh, a lot of great stuff ahead. We haven't even gotten into the dynamic stuff yet, so stay tuned. Lots of wonderful stuff coming from Mr. Cutter. And as always, I want to thank you. Thank you very, very much. You guys are completely and totally awesome. Uh, for supporting me, my efforts at preserving video game history. If you would like to step up to the plate, then just go to the link in the show notes to a site called Patreon. And there you can set up a level of support uh, that you're comfortable with. And we'll add some meaning, personal meaning to you. I often say this, and I've noticed it with the podcasts I listen to. You know, you can listen to a podcast sometimes for years... And for whatever reason, you're just kind of messing around. You keep putting off the support. But, man, once you step that up and, you know, put a dollar into their hat or whatever, you know, the show takes on a whole different significance for you. And just for some reason, I enjoy them a lot more uh, knowing that I'm actually participating in a way, contributing to those uh, shows. So I encourage you to do the same, not just with uh, Matt Chat, but uh, any of the other YouTubers or podcasts or anything that you really enjoy. You know, see if there's a way you can give back. I know they really appreciate it. <laughs> I know I do. Okay, let's see what we've got for the news from the Matt Cave. All right, so what about the news? Well, uh, one is Matt Chat is actually in the news this week. At least if you live in St. Cloud Times, you might have noticed a certain uh, person there on the front page. Look at that uh, rather nerdy looking dude, actually. But uh, anyway, he's... I'm not actually really sure even why. <laughs> what, what crime did he break? Uh, no, they just... Uh, it was kind of cool, actually. The interviewers came by and they had heard about my gameplay documentary and they were kind of excited that a, uh, one of the local professors from St. Cloud State was doing some kind of, you know, stuff that's kind of getting a little bit of a national, really uh, international attention, I guess. So, uh, but anyway, I thought that was cool. Just thought I'd pass that on. Uh, you can read about that on the St. Cloud Times website. They even have a little video there of an interview with me in my socks. Uh, so, uh, check that out. Uh, let's see, in other news, uh, this is kind of interesting. So I know a lot of you guys play a little game called League of Legends. Uh, well, if you do, I guess you probably have seen this already. Uh, if not, though, uh, they're basically the League of Legends, and I've played it a little bit, uh, but they're kind of notorious for a particularly uh, toxic, shall we say, player base. Just some nasty stuff. You know, my guess is it's kind of kids and maybe some hotheads going a little over the top with the uh, sort of racist and sexist stuff. Just stuff that really doesn't belong in, a, uh, in the chats. Uh, so they're trying to create this, uh, they call it a player reform system. Now, I haven't actually looked at it yet, uh, but it looks like it's basically the, at least the first part of this is designed to try to uh, scale back that, uh, what they're calling verbal harassment, stuff I just mentioned. Now, what's interesting about it, though, is it's not just about punishing the uh, wrongdoers, but it's actually a uh, way to reward the uh, people that are doing things that they like. So I'm not quite sure exactly technically how this is going to work out, but I'm really curious from you guys that play a lot of League of Legends. Let me know about this. I want to know what your reactions to it are. You know, I have mine, but I'm kind of outside it really. But I'd really like to hear your thoughts. Also, another interesting opinion piece. Uh, this was a big indie Kickstarters killing actual indie <laughs> games. Uh, it's written by someone named Kate Kironis. Kironis? Kironis? Not really sure how you say her last name. Should <laughs> Sorry about that. But anyway, Kate. And she worked on a game called Elsie... I can't read my own writing here. It looks like Elsinore, a narrative, tragic, narrative tragedy simulator, I think was the way she described that. I uh, haven't looked at the game, don't know much about it, but I'm kind of intrigued by that uh, description. 
Uh, anyway, so the deal is uh, she's saying the games like uh, Bloodstained, uh, the ukulele Kickstarter, uh, they're kind of being, they're kind of ruining, ruining it for all the, for lack of a better word, little folks. Uh, because they come in and they basically say, look, we're trying to raise 500000 and they're showing you footage. And, you know, the, basically what the argument is, they're, they're going to get all this funding from other sources. So they're really not making the game uh, for that 500000 It's just that basically they're using Kickstarter as, I guess, a way to kind of add a little bit of uh, investment. But it's mostly about the PR and sort of excitement around the, the project is what they're really sort of, in her opinion, I guess, abusing the system. Anyway, I thought that was a really interesting opinion, and she gives all kinds of st uh, statistics and things to back this up. Uh, of course, a lot of people are, you know, really upset about the blog, but uh, again, I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on it, and I kind of want to follow up with her, maybe see if I can get in touch with her. Uh, I think it'd be pretty cool to have her on the show to tell us about her game and uh, also about this, uh, the Kickstarter thing, because I hadn't heard that before. Uh, that particular perspective. All right, man, that is a lot of sort of hardcore news, right? What about that ale of the week? Oh, oh man, wait till you see this one. This is a Game of Thrones. I kid you not. Uh, apparently, a licensed Game of Thrones product. Uh, talk about gamer fuel. Well. <laughs> It's probably poison. Anyway, it's a three-eyed raven, dark season, or saison, however the, I think I looked that up once. It looks like season ale. It's uh, from the Omegang Brewery out of Cooperstown, New York. So this is probably something you can find locally if you search for it. It's got 7.2% uh, 7 alcohol by volume, so not bad. You know, more than you'd get from a macro brew, but not, it's, not, it's not crazy. Uh, let's see what we got here on the back. HBO, a part of the Duvel family of fine Belgian ales. It's kind of interesting. I didn't know they were connected to Duvel. Let's see. From the darkness, I watch you, all of you, all of your lives with a thousand eyes and one abiding in the shadows of this dark season lie, beguiling and entrancing aromas and flavors, girded by crisp, lasting herbal op notes and a yeasty, spicy finish. You know who would really appreciate this is Tyrion. Uh, pour slowly to not disturb yeast settlement, but with vigor to make a luxurious head and free the bouquet. Oh, I can't wait to free the bouquet. Yeah, just getting to know already. Anyway, why don't we get this... Oh man, that's a pretty badass label there. It's wet. So, so pungent, it's just coming right through the, the bottle. Three-Eyed Raven. Anyway, let's get this thing open and see what it's all about. All right, this is one that's got the kind of funny, or fun to open bottles. I love these, kind of like champagne. You know, I'm kind of celebrating, right? You know, not every day a guy gets, his, gets an article in the paper. Makes me feel like a real historian or journalist or whatever. What, what am I? I don't even know. Anyway, let's get this open. Oh, hopefully it won't land right on my camera. The anticipation is killing me. Oh, shh. <laughs> you can, come on, that is fun. It's worth getting a little bit. It's, it's worth a couple extra bucks uh, to get that sort of popping experience, right, guys? Okay, let's, I don't know if I poured it with just the right amount of vigor. Looks like I did not. Uh, quite dark. Quite a thick head on this. I think I definitely should have poured slower. As you can see, it's about the color and consistency of a Pepsi or <laughs> Dr. Pepper. Let me guess, you guys are probably more Dr. Pepper, Pib Extra kind of guys. Hopefully you d drink soda. You know, so many of the things I love get such a bad rep. Soda, spam, pork rinds, Vienna sausages. Oh crap! Yeah, this is leaking. Mm. 
oh man, going all over the place. But I can tell you one thing, it is delicious. I had to quickly sip some just to keep it from spilling all over the carpet that my wife recently shampooed. I think I should probably drink the rest of this before she gets home because there probably will be Game of Thrones levels of violence around here when she sees, oh, uh, when she sees what has become of the carpet. Smelling this, the head is kind of crazy. Mm. Man, I just swallowed like two gallons of air. <laughs> Let me uh, pause this for a minute, see if I can clean up a little bit and uh, come back and give you an actual taste test of this. All right, so I've been waiting about an hour now uh, for this head to die down. As you can see, it is still at the top of the rather excellent drinking horn, making me think this uh, ale's about as slow as George R. R. Martin himself writing those big, thick novels he is. I think I might switch to my little glass here just for the sake of getting this done. All right, so smelling it. Very, you definitely smell that sort of Belgian ale, uh, sort of a, almost a Trappist uh, monk, if you're familiar with some of those. Really nice Belgian ales, by far and away my favorite. Uh, I'm getting that kind of aroma off of this. You know, they were joking around about the bouquet and all that on the bottle, but it really does have a nice uh, floral uh, bouquet-like uh, scent to it. Really, really nice, aromatic. I don't see how anybody could smell this and not want to uh, taste it. So let's please do. A very, uh, oh, that's a, quite a few uh, flavors going on here. Let me see if I can pin this down a little bit more before I begin pontificating about it. Okay, you definitely get a nice berry uh, taste of this. Uh, the, the hops and malty flavors are a little bit uh, more subtle than I would have expected. Uh, definitely not bitter at all. Kind of a, a light champagne-like flavor to this, a little bit of a raisin, uh, sort of a raisin taste is what I'm comparing this to. This is a little bit of a, maybe a little bit of a coffee-like flavor there at the end. It's really smooth, really a lighter than I would have thought. Maybe that's because of the head. Uh, maybe I should have poured a little bit more uh, slowly and get, make it a little creamier here at the end, but all in all, it's pretty good stuff. You don't really taste the alcohol. Uh, kind of what I'm tasting really are the uh, sort of berry flavor, the cherry, uh, the, uh, what is that other flavor in there? I guess maybe a little bit of a, uh, it's, it's sort of that cherry raisin kind of flavor. Uh, that's kind of what's really standing out to me. You get a little bit of a bitter aftertaste, but it's not, not nothing to uh, be concerned about. It's actually quite good. Oh no, I gotta I say I'm really, really liking this one. Uh, I think it's gonna go all the way to the top of my charts here. Three-Eyed Raven Game of Thrones. Let's see if I still got some. Yeah, this horn is still pretty foamy. <laughs> Maybe it's reacting to the the, the, maybe the three-eyed ravens reacting to the horn of the uh, horn. Anyway, yeah. So it's pretty good. Other than the disturbing thoughts I'm having about my sister right now, I, I really enjoy this ale. I'm gonna go a full five out of five uh, drinking horns on this. A three-eyed raven dark saison, saison or season ale, however that's uh, pronounced. A really good stuff. I think you'll enjoy this. Plus, it's a really fun bottle, and I know you uh, Game of Thrones fans out there will be interested in it. in it just for that. But I'm very thankful it wasn't just a cash-in. It's actually a really good ale, so uh, you can be... Uh, I guess it lives up to the Game of Thrones label. Whatever that means. Anyway, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking uh, for quotations about the cinema. And I found a... a I'm not going to tell you who this is until the end, but I think you'll be surprised. It goes something like this. I'm one of those people who says, yes, cinema died when they invented sound. 
little quotation there attributed to George Lucas. <laughs> See you guys next week. Quiet, numbskulls, I'm broadcasting.